I will suppose then, not that deity, who is sovereignly good and the fountain of truth, but that some malignant demon, who is at once exceedingly potent and deceitful, has employed all his artifice to deceive me. I will suppose that the sky, the air, the earth, colors, figures, sounds, and all external things are nothing better than the illusions of dreams, by means of which this being has laid snares for my credulity. I will consider myself as without hands, eyes, flesh, blood, or any of the senses, and as falsely believing that I am possessed of these, I will continue resolutely fixed in this belief, and if indeed by this means it be not in my power to arrive at the knowledge of truth, I shall at least do what is in my power, namely, suspend my judgment, and guard with settled purpose against giving my assent to what is false, and being imposed upon by this deceiver, whatever be his power and artifice. But this undertaking is arduous, and a certain indolence insensibly leads me back to my ordinary course of life. And, just as the captive who, perchance, was enjoying in his dreams an imaginary liberty, when he begins to suspect that it is but a vision, dreads awakening, and conspires with the agreeable illusions that the deception may be prolonged, so I, of my own accord, fall back into the train of my former beliefs, and fear to arouse myself from my slumber, lest the time of laborious wakefulness that would succeed this quiet rest, in place of bringing any light of day, should prove inadequate to dispel the darkness that will arise from the difficulties that have now been raised. End First Meditation this recording is in the public domain. Second Meditation Of the nature of the human mind, and that it is more easily known than the body. The meditation of yesterday has filled my mind with so many doubts that it is no longer in my power to forget them, nor do I see, meanwhile, any principle on which they can be resolved, and, just as if I had fallen all of a sudden into very deep water, I am so greatly disconcerted as to be unable either to plant my feet firmly on the bottom or sustain myself by swimming on the surface. I will nevertheless make an effort, and try anew the same path on which I had entered yesterday, that is, proceed by casting aside all that admits of the slightest doubt, not less than if I had discovered it to be absolutely false. And I will continue always in this track until I shall find something that is certain, or at least, if I can do nothing more until I shall know with certainty that there is nothing certain. Archimedes, that he might transport the entire globe from the place it occupied to another, demanded only a point that was firm and immovable. So also, I shall be entitled to entertain the highest expectations, if I am fortunate enough to discover only one thing that is certain and indubitable. I suppose, accordingly, that all the things which I see are false, fictitious. I believe that none of those objects which my fallacious memory represents ever existed. I suppose that I possess no senses. I believe that body, figure, extension, motion, and place are merely fictions of my mind. What is there, then, that can be esteemed true? Perhaps this only, that there is absolutely nothing certain. But how do I know that there is not something different altogether from the objects I have now enumerated, of which it is impossible to entertain the slightest doubt? Is there not a god or some being, by whatever name I may designate him, 
who causes these thoughts to arise in my mind? But why suppose such a being, for it may be I myself am capable of producing them? Am I then at least not something? But I before denied that I possessed senses or a body. I hesitate, however, for what follows from that? Am I so dependent on the body and the senses that without these I cannot exist? But I had the persuasion that there was absolutely nothing in the world, that there was no sky and no earth, neither minds nor bodies. Was I not, therefore, at the same time persuaded that I did not exist? Far from it. I assuredly existed since I was persuaded. But there is, I know not what being, who is possessed at once of the highest power and the deepest cunning, who is constantly employing all his ingenuity in deceiving me. Doubtless, then, I exist, since I am deceived, and let him deceive me as he may, he can never bring it about that I am nothing, so long as I shall be conscious that I am something so that it must in fine be maintained, all things being maturely and carefully considered, that this proposition, I am, I exist, is necessarily true each time it is expressed by me, or conceived in my mind. But I do not yet know with sufficient clearness what I am, though assured that I am, and hence, in the next place, I must take care, lest perchance I inconsiderately substitute some other object in room of what is properly myself, and thus wander from truth, even in that knowledge, cognition, which I hold to be, of all others, the most certain and evident. For this reason, I will now consider anew what I formerly believed myself to be, before I entered on the present train of thought and of my previous opinion I will retrench all that can in the least be invalidated by the grounds of doubt I have adduced, in order that there may at length remain nothing but what is certain and indubitable. What then did I formerly think I was? Undoubtedly I judged that I was a man. But what is a man? Shall I say a rational animal? Assuredly not for it would be necessary forthwith to inquire into what is meant by animal and what by rational, and thus, from a single question, I should insensibly glide into others, and these more difficult than the first. Nor do I now possess enough of leisure to warrant me in wasting my time amid subtleties of this sort. I prefer here to attend to the thoughts that sprung up of themselves in my mind and were inspired by my own nature alone when I applied myself to the consideration of what I was. In the first place, then, I thought that I possessed a countenance, hands, arms, and all the fabric of members that appears in a corpse, and which I called by the name of body. It further occurred to me that I was nourished, that I walked, perceived, and thought, and all those actions I referred to the soul, but what the soul itself was, I either did not stay to consider, or, if I did, I imagined that it was something extremely rare and subtle, like wind, or flame, or ether, spread through my grosser parts. As regarded the body, I did not even doubt of its nature, but thought I distinctly knew it, and if I had wished to describe it according to the notions I then entertained, I should have explained myself in this manner. By body I understand all that can be terminated by a certain figure, that can be comprised in a certain place, and so fill a certain space as therefrom to exclude every other body, that can be perceived either by touch, sight, hearing, taste, or smell, that can be moved in different ways, not indeed of itself, but by something foreign to it, by which it is touched, and from which it receives the impression for the power of self-motion, as likewise that of perceiving and thinking, I held as by no means pertaining to the nature of body. On the contrary, 
I was somewhat astonished to find such faculties existing in some bodies. But as to myself, what can I now say that I am, since I suppose there exists an extremely powerful and, if I may so speak, malignant being, whose whole endeavors are directed towards deceiving me? Can I affirm that I possess any one of all those attributes of which I have lately spoken as belonging to the nature of body? After attentively considering them in my own mind, I find none of them that can properly be said to belong to myself. To recount them were idle and tedious. Let us pass, then, to the attributes of the soul. The first mentioned were the powers of nutrition and walking. But if it be true that I have no body, it is true likewise that I am capable neither of walking nor of being nourished. Perception is another attribute of the soul, but perception too is impossible without the body. Besides, I have frequently during sleep believed that I perceived objects which I afterward observed I did not in reality perceive. Thinking is another attribute of the soul, and here I discover what properly belongs to myself. This alone is inseparable from me. I am, I exist. This is certain. But how often? As often as I think. For perhaps it would even happen, if I should wholly cease to think, that I should at the same time altogether cease to be. I now admit nothing that is not necessarily true. I am, therefore, precisely speaking, only a thinking thing, that is, a mind. Mens siwe animus, understanding, or reason, terms whose signification was before unknown to me. I am, however, a real thing, and really existent. But what thing? The answer was, a thinking thing. The question now arises. Am I aught besides? I will stimulate my imagination with a view to discover whether I am not still something more than a thinking being. Now, it is plain I am not the assemblage of members called the human body. I am not a thin and penetrating air diffused through all these members, or wind, or flame, or vapor, or breath, or any of the things I can imagine. For I supposed that all these were not and without changing the supposition, I find that I still feel assured of my existence. But it is true, perhaps, that those very things which I suppose to be non-existent, because they are unknown to me, are not in truth different from myself whom I know. This is a point I cannot determine, and do not now enter into any dispute regarding it. I can only judge of things that are known to me. I am conscious that I exist, and I, who know that I exist, inquire into what I am. It is, however, perfectly certain that the knowledge of my existence, thus precisely taken, is not dependent on things, the existence of which is as yet unknown to me, and consequently it is not dependent on any of the things I can feign in imagination. Moreover, the phrase itself, I frame and image, a fingo, reminds me of my error. For I should in truth frame one if I were to imagine myself to be anything, since to imagine is nothing more than to contemplate the figure or image of a corporeal thing. But I already know that I exist, and that it is possible at the same time that all those images, and in general, all that relates to the nature of body are merely dreams or chimeras. From this I discover that it is not more reasonable to say I will excite my imagination that I may know more distinctly what I am than to express myself as follows. I am now awake and perceive something real, but because my perception is not sufficiently clear I will of express purpose go to sleep that my dreams may represent to me the object of my perception with more truth and clearness. And therefore, I know that nothing of all that I can embrace in imagination belongs to the knowledge which I have 
of myself, and that there is need to recall with the utmost care the mind from this mode of thinking, that it may be able to know its own nature with perfect distinctness.